Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mahdi Tijani back with you. Now, I was sent in a video by an individual who follows me on, on Instagram, Mir Hadi. Shout out to you, brother. And um, it cons it's concerning the, the now infamous Sister Milan. And initially, I was hesitant to make a reaction video because, frankly, I don't want to give the sister any more clout or exposure. Because in the world of media, any exposure is a good exposure. However, there is a beautiful learning curve, a beautiful lesson that I'm about to teach you, inshallah ta'ala. And it concerns her coming on a live stream with uh, brother Hamza Andreas Zorsis and another brother by the name of, what's his name? Yusuf Ponders. Now, I don't know brother Yusuf Ponders, but I do know brother Hamza. I have an immense amount of respect for him. Um, it's particularly in the field of comparative religion. I, I love, it's a pastime of mine in the past to have watched him dismember atheists when it comes to debates on comparative religion. So this is not a video attacking Brother Hamza in any way, shape or form whatsoever. I have the utmost respect for him. However, there is a lesson that I want to teach and we're going to get into that now. Bismillah. So I had a question for you. I want to, I know it might be a tense topic, but I really want to know the, the truth about this concept of gira, which is protective jealousy, where some people say, a woman can't have a job. She can't uh, be a teacher and have a you know students of male and female. She can't go outside without somebody. She only has to stay inside, and she can't have like any volition to have like education or school. And that if she does, it's an insult to the man's honor, and that she has to submit in that way. Otherwise, she is not honoring her husband's uh, honor and even if it's against her mental health she still has to do it this is something that I've been coming across with some people and I don't know the truth about it I think there's a balance in today's age and you know if you're living in a very dangerous area in California and you can have like two days at, at a job as like a cashier or something to help get out of the ghetto I think that's much smarter than, you know, staying in a place where there's a lot of gun violence or something. There's like a, there must be some sort of balance here. You know, like if yeah. you can stay home and you, you, that's safe. But in today's economy, people lose their jobs, poverty's around. I don't know. I feel All like. Right, enough of that. Enough of that. Too much, too much rambling. Bismillah, let's go forward. All right. We're going to get to Hamza's answer now. And before Brother Hamza answers, most of you who have even a trifling of Islamic knowledge would be able to answer this question quite clearly because of the way the question has been asked. Right? It's quite obvious that in the way that this question has been asked, that the answer is going to be, of course, this is extreme. You know, this is uh, not something that is from Islam, but something that has been taken to its extremes and so on. But I'm going to play the video and we're going to hear Brother Hamza's answer, inshallah. A kind of policy at Sapiens Institute that we don't really go into fit matters, okay? So that's very important. So this question has to go to someone who's qualified and someone that you trust, okay? However, notwithstanding, it's very important to note a few things. Ghira, uh, which is like a positive jealousy for your spouse, which goes both ways, by the way. It's not just the male to the female, it's the female to the man. Is like a protective type of jealousy. And this is highly a high ethic in the Islamic tradition. However, as a general principle, it should not be used to oppress anyone. It should not be used to make anyone feel that their well-being has been diminished, that their self-esteem is diminished, that they have a lack of psychological well-being, mental well-being and physical well-being, and even social well-being. And that difference differs from society to society because there is a concept in fiqh called urf, called the social customs. Now, what... And this concept of urf that Brother Hamza talks about is one of the reasons why I have mentioned in the past, with the exception of a few, that generally speaking, I recommend reverts marry reverts and Muslim born Muslims marry born Muslims. Even sometimes, sometimes it's quite necessary to stay within your culture if you come from a culture of strong cultural norms. Let me give you an example. Um, uh, in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, I'm from Algeria myself, but we have similar cultural norms. I'll give you a story. I was in year eight. I was in Algeria. Uh, I, I used to go there every single year on holiday to Algeria. And um, it was a couple of days before we were about to fly back to the UK. And we drove up to our flats. 
sa maison, harash for, for those of you who know who know what I'm talking about. And my uncle stepped out of the car. Now, I was in the car with my cousin Muhammad, who was one year younger than me. So I was 12 and he was around 11. And my uncle steps up to this big block of flats, 15 stories, and he starts shouting up, Muhammad! I'm like, yo, big man, Muhammad's right here in the car next to me. What are you talking about? And, I, and, I, and then he shouts again, Muhammad! I'm like, who's he calling? Muhammad's right here. And I spoke to and I nudged my cousin Muhammad and I said to him, who's he calling? You're right here. He said to me, no, 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 that we don't, we don't call girls' names in public. He was actually calling his sister, my auntie. And out of respect for these customs, I'm not going to say her name. But he was actually calling his sister, but from his ghira towards his sister, he didn't even want the people to know her name. That's ghira. Now, that's from the customs of this society that we were raised in. For someone from the West, this might be extreme for them. But do you see where the two cultures can clash? On the one hand, you have a culture who doesn't even say the name in public. And on the other hand, you have a culture like Western society where we do a lot more than that. We don't mind parading our wives online and in wherever else and so on. So you can see where the cultures can clash and why I have said that with the exception of a few, generally speaking, I recommend reverts to marry reverts and uh, born Muslim to marry born Muslim, with the exception of a few. What type of exceptions? Those who tend to seek knowledge. Because then they kind of iron out, uh, they iron out those cultural, that cultural baggage that they may have brought with them from their times of jahiliyyah, from the West or wherever it may be. Now, in Saudi Arabia, in the Middle East, and I spent, spent some time living there as well, when you go and meet a man, you don't ask him, how's his wife? You don't say, oh, how's the wife and the kids? Which is quite a normal statement here in the West. And I am of this proclivity as well. I don't ask a man, how's your wife? I certainly, definitely don't mention his wife by name. This is like cardinal sin. Not literally, it's not haram. I'm simply saying, from this cultural norm, this, 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 this urf that Hamza's talking about, is that you don't say the name of the wife. Rude boy, what do you mean how's Sarah or how's Khadija or how's Fatima? Do you know her? Is she your friend? Well, then don't address her by her first name. Furthermore, don't ask me, how's my wife? Don't say, how's your wife, Akhi? No, 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 no. You don't do that. You say, how's your family? كيف العائلة? This is, this is how, the, from the customs, from the urf that Hamza speaks of in the Middle East. You don't say, how's your wife? That's too personal. It's too direct. It's too direct. You say, how's your family? And the recipient of this comment understands immediately. Alhamdulillah, family is good. Barakallahu feek. So these cultural norms are important to understand because if you're coming from two very different cultures, often this can be a huge clash, a, a literal culture shock. and something you have to bear in mind before you choose a spouse to get married to. Describing if someone is preventing you from breathing, preventing you from education, preventing you from all of these things, then that sounds like oppression rather than a gira. Because we have to understand this from a kind of pure spiritual perspective. If one doesn't have an ego, they don't have, for example, the, the diseases of the heart like hasad, jealousy, blameworthy jealousy, kibber and arrogance. Uh, if they don't have these things, then gira, positive jealousy, wanting to take care of their spouse, making sure their spouse is fine, making sure their spouse is basically within the boundaries of the halal and the haram, what Allah loves to go towards that what Allah hates to move away from that that's going to be very positive and it's going to create well-being for each other and the house and society but if it ends up if someone has for example an ego and they're just using the concept of ghira as a veil just to oppress someone just to prevent them from breathing and living and, and living a life that is conducive to coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then this is oppression I'm going to stop it there brother Hamza goes on for another couple of minutes but this is a, a, an excellent generic answer to a question that has been worded well or has wor been worded in a manner that it would be very easy to give such an answer. But now I'm going to show you what the Sister Milan's perspective on Rira actually is. I never want to go back to that. So when some people talk about protective jealousy, like, oh, you have to wear a burqa, you have to sit inside, you can't even look at another man, you can't talk to any other man, you can't have any type of male companions, even if they're into... You can't have any type of male companions. The sister that I mentioned this to Brother Hamza. Milan, I can't quite figure you out. 
I am uncertain as to whether you are from your newness to the dean, you are making these mistakes, or whether you are just plain disingenuous. But I warn, I'm advising you, fear Allah. And to the brothers watching this right now, the reason why I am showing you this video is because human beings in general, but women especially, have a natural proclivity to, when they see, ask a question to seek advice, to word that question in a way that can is conducive to getting them the answer that they want to hear. Now, human beings in general have this tendency, but women in particular are especially prone to this. Why? Because we, women live in a world where they process feelings before logic, before rationale, or before rational thinking, I should say. Feels before reals. Quote, shout out to Robert Tomasi. Feels before reals. Men tend to process logic, rationale first, and then feelings afterwards. So women have a natural proclivity to take their feelings into consideration and then word a question when they're looking for advice in a manner that will that is conducive towards getting an answer that sits with their feelings. And this is my advice to all of you watching. Whenever you hear a woman talk or complain, peel back the onion layers. This is super important. You must peel back the onion layers with questions. And I'll tell you a story um, of a, a time I ran a, club, I ran a clubhouse room a few months back. And I can't remember what the discussion was now, something to do with relationships. And I had this girl come on, this ratchet chick. You know who you are. You're probably watching right now because you still follow me on social media and watch my stories, you nut job. You absolute nutter. Anyway, <clears throat> this sister comes on. I say sister, but you know, Allah alam uh, about her deen because she was quite open about her sins and it doesn't sound sound to me that she had repented. In fact, I believe she had renounced the deen completely. Al Muhim, I'm not naming her, so we'll keep her name anonymous. And she came on and she started complaining with her ratchet ass voice and I was like, okay, I know where we're going here. And then she said, oh, but I was graped. I'm saying graped because YouTube will trigger the word on the, alg uh, the, the, the word the real word will get triggered on the algorithm. I was graped when I was younger and I ended up having a child outside of wedlock. And I don't know what it was, but my spidey senses were tingling. Anyway, there was about 15 other people in that clubhouse room and everyone was like, oh, wow, I'm really sorry to hear that. None of that. I could instantly smell a rat. When I smell a rat, we get to work. So I started peeling back the onion layers. And I said to her, so you were graped when you were younger? She was like, yeah. I was like, okay, and was there evidence for this? She was like, there was a mountain of evidence, unequivocal evidence. I was like, okay, and did you take this to the police? She was like, yep. I took it to the beast and there was watertight evidence, I asked her. There's 100% watertight evidence that this man graped you. She was like, yep, absolutely. And then I said to her, I asked her, so then what happened? How many years did he get in prison? Get, did he get in prison? She said to me, oh, the police let him off. They didn't pursue anything. So I said to her, hold on a minute. In a country where men are imprisoned or at least cautioned by the police for much less than that, you're telling me you had watertight evidence that this man had spiked your drink, so she had claimed that he had spiked her drink in the club, intoxicated her somehow, and then date graped her afterwards. You had watertight evidence for this, chemical report and all, and all the rest of it, and yet the judge just said, you know what, Pff, it doesn't matter, we'll just let it go. She was like, yeah. I said to her, cap, cap, absolute cap, you're lying. Do you know what happened next? She started wiling out, swearing and cussing and effing and blinding and calling all the odds. Why? Because she was found out live on a clubhouse room. I found her out. Whilst everyone else was given her sympathy, which is probably what she was used to, I sensed something, pulled back the onion layers and called her out on her BS. And if I was wrong, she would never have reacted that way in the first place. She most probably would have ended up crying. If I had called her out on that and, and said to her that she's lying and she was actually truthful, women tend to fall apart and cry because they're so hurt by it. Quite the opposite. She turned into a tigress and she tried to go for the jugular. So what I want you to understand, gentlemen, is when you're dealing with women in particular, human beings in general, men and women alike have this natural proclivity to ask questions in a way that favor them. But women in particular, because they live in a world of feels before reals, feelings before reality, you must be a master onion layer peeler. That makes sense. Master onion peeler layer, whatever you want to call it. Start asking questions. Pull back the onion layers and you will see how the individual will eventually start contradicting themselves and tripping over their own web of nonsense if 
That is the case, just by asking questions. Well, the scholar, you can never be alone with a man. It's just... I don't know if you caught that. You can never be alone with a man. The sister has a problem with never being alone with a man. Now, again, I'm trying to give you the benefit of the doubt, Minan. You're a new Muslim. Maybe this is difficult for you because from the culture that you have come from, <clears throat> you come from a culture where spending time with men in a casual sense is quite normal to you. I'm trying to give you the benefit of the doubt here, but you need to understand that this is not a cultural thing. Men and women can't be friends. Even in your culture, amongst the non-Muslims, they are starting to wake up and realize that men and women can't be friends. We can't associate with each other in a friendly manner, outside of the complete and utter necessary. It's impossible. It is impossible. It's not a cultural thing. It's a human thing. Men and women can't be friends, and you have a problem with that. That's a massive red flag. And being forced to only be around women is some that sounds god awful. So, Shall I play that again? And being forced to only be around women is some that sounds god awful. It sounds god awful to be to to have to spend time just with women. <sighs> You know, I, I I got no commentary on that. I'll let you make your own decisions. Let me know what you think in the comments. Only have to be around women sounds like a just terrible. Oh my gosh, to be around women who've been sheltered their whole life for like calm little hands. Oh my gosh, and not even be able to sit. And so I ask you, watching right now. What do you think Brother Hamza's answer would have been if he had known, if he was informed by this sister who took this video just a couple of days before, that the idea of spending time just with women sounds terrible. That to not have any male companion sounds awful. What do you think his response would have been in his answer to her? It would have been very different, but that's my point, you see. On some level of consciousness, it appears this sister knows that and that she's filtered out that information quite uh, meticulously because to say something like that will get her an answer she doesn't want to hear. Because otherwise, if you were truly ignorant on this topic, Sister Milan, you would have said it. I enjoy spending time with men. I like having male companions. But you didn't. You filtered that out. Why? And as a result, Brother Hamza gave his answer with the information that he had to hand. And that is why I say Peel back the onion layers. I don't know what to say, man. I don't know what to say. But this is, this is major. This is major. This is absolutely major. Men and women cannot be friends. Men and women can't even be associates outside of the absolutely necessary. If you go to work and you have no choice but to work with this woman, you know, or maybe you're a woman and you're single and you need to make ends meet and you have no choice but to work with this man, fine, do what you gotta do, man. Do what you got to do. But outside of that, if you feel a need to spend time with the opposite sex, this is a major red flag. Major red flag. Now, the sister talks about in the beginning of this video here, and you can find it on her page. She talks, the title is Ghira, Protective Jealousy. And she talks about PTSD that she has from being with one man who um, expressed an extreme form of Ghira. It's not even Ghira, it was just straight oppression. She was oppressed, she was hurt. For nine years, she was in a toxic relationship, and this is the end result. And now, gentlemen, you understand why I say to you that getting with women who have ha had previous relationships is a nightmare. It's a nightmare because there's so much work that you have to undo. So much hard work that you have to undo. And you have, if you have developed yourself to be a top shelf man, you have the pick of the litter. You don't need to pick from the... From, uh, the choices of a woman who are going to make your life more difficult when you could pick from those who will make your life easier. And being forced to only be around women, uh, that's, that's horrible. That's to me, because I grew up around a lot of men, as I say, the American lifestyle, going to classes, there's boys and girls. To be forced to be around women when growing up, I didn't ever just hang out with women. I have like today, like five female friends. And I know you say, oh, all male friends want to smash. They all want to get... Yes, all male friends want to smash. That's another major red flag. You, you've got only five female friends. By the sounds of it, you have a great deal more friends than that. And only five of them are females. Sister, I don't know what to tell you, man. 
I really want khair for you. I want you to get married and be happy to someone. But you are doing a stellar, platinum, 24 karat gold job of wrecking your chances of getting with anyone. You need to just shut the hell up. Stop talking. If you want to get married, you need to go and seek knowledge, get therapy and stop talking. Because every time you make a video like this, you put the nail in the coffin. All right, the next part of this video is what I really wanted to tackle and really wanted to address. So let's just get straight into it. But please, uh, Milihan, please give us your other question, inshallah. Okay, so I've noticed there is a, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's called a red pill movement where these young brothers are telling younger brothers that divorced women and, you know, revert sisters who are not virgins are like toxic trash. And they're really teaching the young men to not ever marry a single mother, to stay away from divorced women. And they're really being quite vulgar towards, you know, the younger men and how they're trying to find wives. And since polygamy, you know, polygyny is allowed, this would, th that system of polygyny is beneficial towards women who have had a brutal... Okay, so what's going on here once again, gentlemen? Find me one video amongst the Muslims, Muslims who have been uh, distilling red pill principles for the purpose of understanding it, as, understanding it as a Muslim, who have called single mothers toxic trash. Find me where. If you can find me, then fine. If, sister, you have read these type of comments in the comment section, well then, you can't hold, uh, you can't hold YouTubers responsible for the comments of others. But what I believe is the most likely scenario of what has happened here is that once again, you feel like you've been labeled as toxic trash. That's how your feelings have interpreted what you have heard. And as a result of that, you are now asking questions once again in a manner that is conducing towards getting a specific type of response, which is exactly what Brother Hamza is about to give her. You can already predict what type of response Brother Hamza is about to give her, but we're going to hear him out anyway and stuff like that so what would you say to like those young brothers who are trying to really brainwash these young brothers into hating uh women because they're western women who are not virgins and who see who are brainwashing other young brothers into hating women immediately i would have asked the sister right here where did you see this which video whereabouts in the video just ask questions what where what where very simple because the moment you do that, the truth will either re reveal itself or it won't, because it's not there in the first place. So again, I'm, I'm advising you gentlemen, when you're dealing with women, you have to dig. You have to pull back the onion layers. You can't just take firsthand what a woman says to you. You need to ask questions and pull back the onion layers because they are prone. They have a natural proclivity towards asking questions that are aligned with their feelings. Or divorcees or single mothers and stuff like that. What would you say to that? Yeah, so I'm not yes. aware of this. I'm not aware of this. Um, uh, but again, this is in the realm of the fiqh issue, but it's to do with Islamic values and ethics, which we do talk about. The first thing to say is these men are little boys, very weak individuals who have no spirituality and have no connection with Islam or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if you really take the logical consequence of what they said, they are actually saying that the Prophet ﷺ was not a real man. May Allah protect us from such stupidity. Because the Prophet ﷺ married uh, uh, women who were basically not virgins. The Prophet ﷺ married women who had uh, previous husbands and so on and so forth. So to even make such a ridiculous claim is counter to the life of the Prophet It's absolutely ridiculous. Yes, we have our ethical tradition and there's virtues for marrying this type of woman or that type of woman or this type of man and that type of man. But the biggest virtue as a general principle is someone who is pious, someone who is close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the reward for marrying a divorcee who has children or a widow is absolutely phenomenal. And if I would like to respectfully, because there's a few things I have to say, but I'd like to respectfully challenge Brother Hamza here. And that is, where in the Quran and Sunnah is there any ayah or hadith pertaining to the reward 
a specific ayah or hadith pertaining to the reward of marrying a divorcee and taking on her children. Because I haven't found it anywhere. Marrying a widow and taking on her orphan children? Yes, absolutely. I know these ahadith, you can find them in Bukhari. One that comes to mind specifically. But where specifically are these ayat or ahadith pertaining to marrying a divorcee and taking on her children? I'd like to see them. I've never seen them. When you knew that reward, they wouldn't even utter such nonsense. So from that perspective, just like if there is a movement where you, wherever you're from in America that these guys are saying such stuff, these people actually, they need a social, intellectual, and spiritual slap. Yeah, <laughs> uh, because to all due respect, these guys are pathetic. They have probably a sense of arrogance. They have the psychosocial issues. They're using the dean uh, as some form of gang. And this is a, a trend that you see throughout societies. And these people should be shunned, shouldn't be taken seriously. And they should basically, maybe they should take some pills because they're not mentally, not mentally well. So I hope Brother Hamza sees this because just by asking a few more questions, this, this whole response could have been avoided. But never mind, we'll go into it, inshallah. <clears throat> Look, I've discussed this many times in the past, but I'll say it again. And you can find these videos uh, on my channel. In fact, I might even add them in the end cards. When we tell sisters, or, or brothers rather, I should say, that it is sunnah to marry a divorcee, what are we doing here? Well, firstly and foremostly, we need to make a distinction and I know for those of you who are watching my channel, this is going to be repetitive, but bear with me because there's going to be new people watching. When, where, when we say it is sunnah to marry a divorcee, what we are saying is, is that it is recommended to marry a divorcee. Like it is sunnah to pray the two raka'at before fajr. Like it is sunnah to fast Mondays and Thursdays. All of this we have evidences for. Where in the deen do we have, in the religion, do we have ayat or a hadith pertaining to the recommendation to marry divorcees? You cannot find it. You cannot find it. Now, bear in mind that 70 to 80 percent of all divorces are initiated by women. 70 to 80 percent of all divorces are initiated by women. Why? Because women, not because of domestic violence, contrary to popular belief, the number one reason of why women trigger divorce is disenchantment. Disenchantment. We were like two ships passing in the night. We were no longer friends anymore. Um, things like along those lines. Disenchantment. And you know the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ about the, the ungrateful wife. I mentioned it in my previous video. In fact, let me pull it up right now. It was narrated that Abdullah ibn Abbas, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, said, The Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, said, I was shown hell and I have never seen anything more terrifying than it. And I saw the majority of his people were women. And they said, why, O Messenger of Allah? And he said, because of their ingratitude, kufr. It was said, are they ungrateful to Allah? And he said, they are ungrateful to their husbands and ungrateful for good treatment. If you are kind to one of them for a lifetime, and then she sees one undesirable thing in you, she will say, I have never had anything good from you. This is from the natural proclivity of a woman, is her natural state is ingratitude. And it makes, it's in perfect uh, synchrony with the top five reasons as to why women pull the trigger on divorce or on a marriage, sorry. Disenchantment. Disenchantment. Now I'm coming. I'm coming somewhere with this. Why am I raising this point? This is why I'm raising this point. Because if we tell brothers that it is sunnah to marry divorcees, what do you think, it, which by the way, I have found no proof for, to say it is the sunnah, it is a sunnah, but it is not the sunnah. And I've clarified this distinction in the past. And I'm not a scholar or talib alim or anything. But I'll make this simple distinction. And that is, from the sunnah, or not all of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ are meant for us to follow. You know this. Some of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ are actually prohibited for us to follow. Haram. Finished. You cannot follow. I'll give you an example. From the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was to pray the entire night. We are prohibited from doing so. From the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Was to fast consecutive day and night That's his sunnah We are prohibited from doing so From the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Was that he married 10 women 10 wives 10 mothers of the believers At the same time We are prohibited Categorically from doing so So we can see here That not all sunan Are there for us to follow in fact, some sunan, which is the plural of sunnah, are categorically haram, qat, 
for us to follow, for us to do. And that is why as a matter of principle in fiqh, and I'm not a faqih or even anywhere close, but I know this much, that as a matter of principle in fiqh, we take what the Prophet ﷺ said over what he did. Because sometimes he did things which were an exception for him alone. And that is why we take what he said over what he did. So I ask respectfully and humbly to our beloved brother Hamza here, where in the deen is there a hadith or an ayah pertaining to the reward in marrying a divorcee or taking care of a divorcee's children? The widow and the orphans, I know 100% I'm with you, Akhi. I am with you. But where do we see this for the divorcee? Now, for the, for the, 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 the main point that I want to make, the pièce de la résistance, I still don't even know what that means, but I know the context to use it in. When a sister hears that it is sunnah to marry a divorcee, and this sister is currently disenchanted with her husband for no particular reason, but from her natural proclivity, as I've already covered, is to be un ungrateful towards her husband. What feeling, what thoughts will come to her mind when she hears the, brother say, the brothers saying, Brothers, it's sunnah to marry divorcees. Shall I tell you what she's thinking? You know what? To hell with this marriage. I'm going to pull the trigger on this marriage. Get a divorce. Because the brothers are saying it's sunnah to marry divorcees. This gives carte blanche to sisters who are considering leaving their marriages for trivial reasons, which is the vast majority, to leave their marriages and then find another, another husband pronto. Carte blanche. We cannot have that. Do you want to know why? I had this discussion with my brother Fayyad, shout out to him, from T3M the other day. I said to him, Fayyad, you know when I wake up every day and I do these videos for free? Do you know why I do this, Akhi? This is why I do this. Because my children are being raised in a broken home without mother and father living together. And I have seen, witnessed firsthand the harms, the ill effects that, ch that children are exposed to when they are raised in broken homes. Therefore, I want to eliminate divorce, period. I'm, of course, I will never achieve, never achieve that, but I sure will, inshallah ta'ala, push that notch just a little bit closer to getting these divorce rates down. That's why I do this. I don't want children to be raised in single parent households anymore, especially single mother households, which is much worse than single father households. This is not my opinion. You can find these stats which are clear in uh, Dr. Will Farrell's book, The Boy Crisis. Clear! Children raised in single mother homes are an epic disadvantage to those children raised in nuclear homes, even in comparison to children raised in single father homes. Single father homes, they do better. But neither of the two, neither single parent households can compare with children raised in nuclear homes. We are better together than we are apart. And this is why I have a massive problem with <coughs> the Muslim community saying, it is sunnah to marry divorcees. I have not seen an ayah or read a hadith which indicates this. Rather, there is a great harm, damage that can come from this statement because it instills the seed, the idea into a woman's mind, into a wife's mind who may be thinking of pulling the plug on her marriage that, you know what, there was, someone's going to be there to catch me when I fall, so I'm going to pull the plug on this marriage. Who cares? To hell with the children. It doesn't matter. I'll find another dad for them. No. Enough of this nonsense. Enough of this nonsense. Because what they're saying is against the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to talk about women in this way and to, 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 to judge women this way is absolutely ridiculous. In actual fact, in actual fact, if they study Islam, if a woman has had a past and she was a non-Muslim and she became a Muslim, he has no right to know anything about her past. Zero. In actual fact, even if it was a woman who was Muslim and had a past and she repented, none of his business. None of his business. The one who repents, right, is like the one who hasn't sinned. Yeah? These people... Absolutely, 100%. And the one who repents, exactly as Brother Hamza said, is like the one who hasn't sinned. And Allah will forgive you. That doesn't mean I have to. And let me tell you why. Women who have been ran through by men are less capable, significantly less capable of pair bonding with another man. And Abu Ammar Khan quoted, cited a study the other day, which suggested that from as, as a woman goes from one intimate partner to the next, her ability to pair bond diminishes dramatically. Why do I tell brothers, think twice before you marry a divorcee, especially if she's had multiple marriages, or if she has a jahiliya and she was ran through in her jahiliya? Why do I tell brothers this? 
I tell you why I tell brothers this. It goes back to my why. It goes back to why I wake up every single morning and make these videos. Because if you marry a woman who's been ran through, whether it was in halala or whether it was in haram from her jahiliya, her ability to pair bond with you is heavily diminished. Women are like stickers. The first time you stick the sticker on the wall, it sticks nicely. If you remove that sticker, it's lost a bit of a stickiness. The second time you stick it on the wall, it will stick, but not as strongly. You take it off. Now, every time you reapply that sticker, there is less and less stick to it. That is the similitude of a woman who has had multiple intimate partners. And do you know what happens? You are gonna have kids with this woman. And then what happens? Your kids are raised in a broken ass home because she doesn't have what it takes to keep the marriage together, to keep the relationship together. Her ability to pair bond is diminished tremendously. So yes, Allah forgives you, but that doesn't mean I need to take you on because we're out here trying to build, build. We want to get with a woman who is going to offer us the greatest likelihood of making this marriage work over a lifetime so that we can raise our children in nuclear homes. As it is, divorce rates here in the West are already at 50%. Why am I going to shoot myself in the foot, in the foot and get with a sister who's had multiple previous relationships or multiple previous marriages, which is only going to increase the likelihood of divorce? <coughs> and I can't remember which study I read, which, uh, and this is uh, intellectually lazy of me right now, I should have brought up this study, but never mind. But it, 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 it suggested that first time divorce, likelihood of a divorce is 50%. Second time around, for a lady specifically, for a woman specifically, 65%. 65% likelihood the marriage will fail. Third time around, 70% likelihood that the marriage will fail. And it's intellectually lazy of me, of having not brought these stats beforehand. You can go and find them yourself. So again, we want to build. We want to build. And I know if I ask Brother Hamza, I said to him, Brother, Brother Hamza, there's a sister. Uh, she was a prostitute in Jahiliya. She had 150 men run through her. But now, alhamdulillah, she's uh, reverted to Islam and she's practicing. Do you want to marry her? I don't know, Brother Hamza, but I'm quite confident what his answer will be. I'm quite confident. I'm quite confident. And I'm quite confident that most of you will not take that sister on. Allah forgives her. But that doesn't mean I have to get with her. And gentlemen, yes, it is true that you cannot ask about the, someone's past. But you need to get smarter than that. You need to find out ways through conversation of establishing whether this woman has had a past or not. Through com normal casual conversation. No need to ask directly. Because your kids' lives depend on it. The well-being of your children's lives depend on it. I cannot say this with any more passion than I am already. Your kids' lives and well-being of being raised in a nuclear home depend on it. Don't be lazy. Find out. All right, I'm going to add the... I'm going to add the link to that video in the description. <clears throat> uh, brother Yusuf Ponders goes on and uh, speaks a bit about the red pill. And he mentions how it's quite a, there's elements of nihilism to it, which I completely agree with, by the way. There is absolutely, it's actually called the black pill. I know all of these stupid pills, right? But um, nihilism in the sense of, oh, well, if women only like men who are six foot tall and have a six pack and six figures and so on, then there's no hope for me. There's definitely an element of nihilism to it that you have to be careful with, for sure. Nevertheless, the lesson I want you, the audience, you watching this right now, to take from this video is that when you are dealing with women, human beings in general, men and women alike, but especially women, you need to be a master onion layer peeler. You need to ask more questions. That's it. Just ask questions. And if the individual is being disingenuous, they will trip themselves up. Hit the like, hit the subscribe. Assalamu alaikum wa